Hi, everyone. It's Julia Pfister, and welcome to our lecture on the artist, Roy Lichtenstein. Um, after we learned all about pop last week, let's get started. So just as a reminder, let's go back and take a look, little bit of a look again at what pop art is. So pop artists uh, wanted to express their optimism to a culture born during post-World War II who sought to acquire consumer goods in response to mass media advertising. Pop art did not critique consumers, it simply recognized it as the natural fact of the times. So that after all the deprivation of the war, now all these things were available and they kind of took advantage of that. Um, pop artist Richard Hamilton kind of listed the characteristics of pop art um, as popular, designed for a mass audience, transient, expendable, uh, low cost, mass produced, aimed at the youth, witty, sexy, gimmicky, glamorous, and big business, which we certainly know it was. So modernist crit critics were horrified by the pop artist use of such low subject matter and by their apparently uncritical treatment of it. In fact, pop took uh, art into new areas of subject matter and developed new ways of presenting it. And it can really be seen one of the first manifestations of uh, postmodernism, where that was art that was after the wars and really um, uh, art that was after really from the Renaissance up, till, up to the abstract expressionists, which this came right after. So Roy Lichtenstein, of course, was one of the key figures of the pop art movement. Um, along with Andy Warhol and Jasper Johns and James Rosenquist. He was born in 1923 in New York to an upper middle class Jewish family. He showed an affinity for art from a young age and later went to Ohio University where he was able to take art classes. He was drafted into the army in 1943 and served for three years um, and during which time though he was actually able to visit the Louvre. Um, he returned to Ohio University where he completed his studies and later became an instructor. His early work, um, this is up till 19, early 1960s, can, uh, covered a wide range of styles and subject matter. He would experiment with a variety of different materials such as pastel, ceramics, even metals like silver and bronze, but never quite achieved success until pop art. So after being an instructor um, and also painting even his version of abstract expressionism, at age 38, Roy Lichtenstein created the breakthrough painting, Look Mickey in 1961. This declared the emergence of the pop art style. Lichtenstein appropriated the scene from popular culture showing two Disney icons, Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck in a humorous situation. Situation. Now, there were multiple stories told about this, how it came about. Uh, one that he discovered the image in a bubblegum wrapper, um, or it was inspired by um, a conversation with artist Alan Capro. Um, there was also the thought that um, he had put a Mickey up in one of his kids' bedrooms, and the kids said to the dad, Hey, do you think you can paint better than that? So, this is how this kind of, what kind of the genesis of this. So in Look Mickey, um, Lichtenstein um, explored the uh, idea of mechanical reproduction in the printing process, imitating the technique through the language of painting. So again, so it's, and we'll talk about this later, but it's about taking the mechanics of something that's already there and transforming it into um, a painting that, that was oil on canvas and you know, normally would have been one of, uh, you know, one of the old master's paintings. So he hand painted uh, dots on Mickey's face and Donald's eyes, uh, mimicking the ink dots of the Bend Aid printing process that was used in comic books. So Look Mickey actually brought uh, Lichtenstein the mainstream success that he hoped for, but he also received harsh criticism. He was criticized for counterfeiting commercial images. And famously, an art critic told him he was one of the worst artists in America. Um, art historians and critics uh, regard Look Mickey as revolutionary work and also really the, the very beginnings of the pop movement. So while Lichtenstein's um, work uh, draws on popular imagery from advertising and cartoons, um, it also involves this degree of appropriation. The artist himself acknowledged that the act is really one of transformation. He said, I am nominally copying but I'm really restating the copied thing in other terms. In doing that, the original acquires a totally different texture. 
So by taking the calming strip and using it as he does, he conflates the powerful but so-called low uh, mass-produced commercial image with this traditionally venerated medium of large-scale easel painting. So kind of this interesting uh, marriage of the two. Oops. So this is his sleeping girl. Um, uh, and again, comic books were the primary sources for uh, Lichtenstein's um, paintings in the early 1960s. In paintings like Sleeping Girls, he imitated the tradition of comic strips, the thick black lines that outline the areas of primary colors and the uniform area of the Bende dots that were used in the printing process of inexpensive publications. Now, he actually hand painted the Bende dots and this became a, a, his signature style. Um, and allowed him to incorporate the look of mechanical reproduction into the traditional medium, medium of painting. So mixing that, uh, the, the lowbrow of commercialism into the highbrow of easel painting. He found the style of comic books particularly appealing because it allowed him to depict emotionally charged subject matters like love and war in a very detached manner. The paintings brought Lichtenstein uh, mainstream success, but initially he also uh, received harsh criticism. He was also accused of counterfeiting commercial images and was again, uh, even called one of the worst artists in America. And now we see where that article was. So in 1964, Life Magazine published a profile of the pop artist um, accompanied by the headline, is he the worst artist in the US? This might seem uh, overly aggressive at this point in time um, uh, because uh, he is represented in almost every major museum uh, all around the world. And this gulf between high and low art is certainly completely different than it was in the early 60s. But at the time, um, he certainly looked to some at least like an artist who had just caught a lucky break and was just copying all these things. So quite interesting. So I wanted to talk a little bit about this Ben Day process. So this was named after illustrator and printer Benjamin Henry Day Jr. So Ben Day, um, and it's a printing and photo engraving technique dating from 1879. Um, while the Ben Day process is commonly described in terms of dots, um, it could also be used with parallel lines, textures, irregular fix, uh, irregular lines, um, or wave lines. Um, and of course, this became the hallmark of, of Roy Lichtenstein. And other illustrators and graphic designers have used um, enlarged Bende dots as well, um, coming from this. Um, so Lichtenstein actually restricted his paint colors to imitate the four colors of the printer's ink um, while he was using these Bende dots. Um, he really admired the way that comics uh, artists of the 1950s condensed subjects such as love and war into a strip cartoon from American comic books. Uh, and so it's just, he was fascinated with this whole thing and that's where all his work generated from. Now in his paintings and prints, Roy Lichtenstein is basically a storyteller. His scenes, which are usually contrasted by the strong primary tones, allow us to glimpse fragments of conversations, exchanges and thoughts. This drops the viewer, this drops us into the introspection of the characters who are looking into their mind, who are often expressive, uh, consumed or consumed by grief or happy. Um, and in America, full of hyper consumption, the artist brings us portraits, portraits of concerned individuals, sometimes with tearful eyes. His art style was, of course, highly unusual at the time and was characterized by simplifying these close up portraits into blocks of colors that really gave it this contemporary finish. Now, uh, Roy also um, chose glamorous women as his subjects, uh, and he was very, very much known for not denigrating women or, or, or using the male gaze or anything like that. Um, and so this made his work particularly fashionable and popular. Um, there are clear similar similarities with the career of Andy Warhol, who also had exceptional illustration skills and which he also combined with these uh, simple blocks of color. And just for a comparison of, of when we were talking about the low art and is he the worst artist, this pertaining, uh, painting here in 2005, um, it was once owned by Steve Martin and later Steve Wynn, went for a record, record 42.6 million in Christie's November sale. So 
he did quite well. Um, and I've also know that uh, Lichtenstein himself did very well and never really suffered um, the, the artist fate or, or uh, had to take other jobs or things like that, that he was quite successful with this. Now, Wham from 1963 is a large two canvas painting that takes its composition from a comic book strip. The left-hand canvas features an American fighter plane firing a missile into the right-hand canvas and hitting an approaching enemy plane, which winds up in the wham. The outline of this is this resulting explosion in the yellow and red and white. Um, again, he's using the primary colors outlined by black and the Bende dots. Uh, the work's composition is taken from a panel drawn by Irv Novick, which appeared in issue number 89 of the All-American Men of War. Uh, published in February of 1962. And according to the artist, uh, the diptych took one month to produce from start to finish. So it kind of gives you an idea of that. Um, Lichtenstein also explained the significance of military subject matter uh, that he chose for many of his paintings from 1962 to three. At that time, I was interested in anything I could use as a subject that was emotionally strong, usually love or war or something that was highly charged or an emotional matter. Also, I wanted the subject matter to be opposite to be to the removed and deliberate painting techniques. So quite interesting. So very pur purposeful what he was doing. And this is his uh, another one. Um, uh, we know he used the war images. And again, this was borrowed from the comic book strips for the explosions. Um, the subject embodies the revolutionary nature of pop art. And, but it also suggests uh, the very real threat of annihilation by nuclear explosion that was prevalent at the time. So the Cuban Missile Crisis occurred in 1962. So this, these would have been very common topics. Um, Lichtenstein was also interested in the, in the way dynamic events like explosions were depicted in the stylized form of comic illustrations. The print incorporates many of the hallmarks of his early painting style the flat primary colors, the bende dots, and the outlining. And I also wanted you to notice up there, it says magna paint. Um, so magna paint is actually made from acrylic resin. Um, and it has quite a few differences from plain acrylic that appeal to them. Um, for one, it gives a glossier finish um, than compared to acrylic. And he believed that it displayed colors better compared to water-based acrylic paints. And it was also easier to move with turpentine. So most of all of his paintings, I don't think I, put it on here a lot, um, were in oil and magna paint. So although there is an element of irony and humor in Lichtenstein's style, his work lies within the classic traditional of control and the use of line, sh shape, tone, and color as compositional elements. So his, the pictures are structured very typically like uh, pictures they were used to. Um, the discipline of the work is cerebral with little left to impulse or motion or what he calls the character of art. He says, my work sanitizes it, it sanitizes emotion, but it is also symbolic of commercial art sanitizing human feelings. I think it can be read that way. People mistake the character of line for the character of art, but really it's really the position of the line that's important or the position of anything, any contrast, not the character of it. So uh, just this whole idea that, um, he's taking the emotion out of it, um, but still presenting it in, in an emotional way. So this was um, uh, from a series in 1965 to 66, where he made a series of pict picture, pictures, paintings, um, depicting enlarged brushstrokes. Now, ironically, the motif was taken from a printed source. And this was a comic book, again, called The Painting, printed in Strange Suspense Stories in October 1964. Here, Lichtenstein used it to make a direct comment on the elevated content and loaded brushwork of abstract expressionism. The brushwork, as the token of the artist's personal expression, is depersonalized. This motif is screen printed onto paper in a manner that is usually associated with everyday advertising or publishing to the effect that it seems banal and everyday. And red and white brushstrokes uh, sold for 28.5 million in May of 2017. Pretty amazing. 
So again, um, abstract expressionist artists had made the brushstroke a vehicle to directly communicate feelings as we see in Jackson Pollock's work. So that was, they were literally throwing the paint, you know, literally they said came from the brain off the arm to the, to the hand, to the brush, off onto the, to the paper. So emotion was going out there. So Lichtenstein's brushstroke made a mockery of this aspiration, also suggesting that abstract expressionists disdain commercialization, but they were not immune to it either. After all, many of their pictures were also created in series using the same motifs again and again. Lichtenstein has said, the real brushstrokes are still just as predetermined as the cartoon brushstrokes. And so again, it was all this idea about appropriating popular images and reimagining them. So here he's reimagining just a brushstroke, which is kind of a touch of genius. So in the 1960s, there was a deliberate attempt by artists and print publishers to reach a bigger um, audience for art through the production of prints that would be released in large editions. This objective was facilitated by screen printing, a process which yielded many more examples than the more traditional printmaking methods, such as engraving or lithography. Uh, this print is from a portfolio um, entitled 10 Works by 10 Painters, and it was produced in an edition of 500 prints in 1964. It was printed on plastic. This is one of Lichtenstein's first pop prints and the first to be made on a surface other than paper. So his printmaking is distinguished by the artist's use of technical innovations and experimental materials. So he's still an artist experimenting with things and still trying different things instead of using the tried and true. So uh, quite a genius. So if we look in the upper uh, back right there of this painting, we see something that may look familiar from our look Mickey. So um, uh, this kind of, this painting here actually highlights the significance of look Mickey um, uh, because he is repeating it again. So up till now, uh, Roy had developed a pop art style that was based on the visual vernacular of mass communication, which was the comic strip with the black outlines, bold colors and bende dots. Um, what actually changed through the development of his art was his subject matter, which evolved from comic strips to exploration, exploration of modernist art styles. So his comic strip uh, images initially had great shock value, but like much of pop art, they were quickly embraced by the galleries and collectors. Uh, he remarked, it was hard to get a painting that was despicable enough so that no one would hang it. Everybody was hanging everything. It was almost acceptable to hang a dripping paint rag. Everybody was accustomed to this. The one thing everyone hated was commercial art, but apparently they didn't hate that enough either. So I love his quotes uh, in talking about all this. So um, Lichtenstein was also particularly fascinated by the abstract way in which cartoonists drew mirrors using diagonal lines to denote a reflective surface. He once remarked, now you see those lines and you know it means mirror, even though there are obviously no such lines in reality. It's a convention we unconsciously accept. So the mirror really became a motif for him during the 1970s. Um, and he really experimented with the graphic representation of this. Um, and this was driven in part by an interest in the relationship between women and mirrors, both in historical artworks and in contemporary culture. Now, although the series might be inspired by the appearance of mirrors in cartoons, Lichtenstein clearly wanted to engage with themes of reproduction and reflection, which have interested artists at least as far back as the Renaissance. So really considering his place in art history here. And this is of course uh, in bronze, painted bronze there. So he did do a lot of sculptures. I don't think I have many more in here, but he did a lot of sculptures as well. So he also did a series of reflection prints, um, again, with the, the mirror and the reflection. So we see here the image is partly, partially obscured by these semi-abstract blocks of color and pattern, which again would have simulated the reflected light. Um, the idea was developed by Lichtenstein in a group of paintings he started in 1988 and which he continued to work on um, until 1993. Now, speaking of the painting series in 1995, the artist explained, it started when I tried to photograph a print by Robert Rauschenberg that was under glass, but the light from a window reflecting on the surface of the glass and prevented me from taking a good picture. But it gave me the idea of photographing fairly well-known works under glass 
where the reflection would hide most of the work, but you could still make out what the subject was. Well, I tried to do a few photographs in this manner, but I'm not much of a photographer. Later, the idea occurred to me to do the same idea in painting, and I started this series on various early works of mine. So just, an, again, another artist who can just continues to keep pushing and pushing himself um, and exploring new ways um, to, to, to express his art and also to push his own style further. So like many um, artists of his era, uh, Lichtenstein was still a student when he discovered the works of modernists from the previous generation, particularly those of uh, Picasso and Matisse. Now, Lichtenstein was inspired by works of his favorite painters as early as 1962, um, when he painted a version of Picasso's Femme au Chapeau. It's interesting how Lichtenstein's use of source material from comics to masterworks leaves no, leaves no room in his work for value distinctions between so-called high and low culture. He approaches them with both the same a rigorous attention to detail and holds neither so sacred as to leave them unmarked by his own aesthetic interests. So, and it, he was also concerned about his place in art history, but it was also more about, he was just using comic strips before, but now he was using recognized, um, well-known artworks and, and putting his own spin on it. Uh, again, to, to express this idea that was one greater or less than the other, um, and the answer is probably no, but it's also up to the eye of the observer. And so here's his sleeping muse, another one of his sculptures, another bronze one, uh, based on Constantine Brancusi's work. And uh, this is his one. Um, he actually painted uh, several of Picasso's in the same style. This one was uh, based on one of the portraits of Dor Dora Mar. And again, he did it uh, in the, with the Bende dots, with the bright colors and with the, the, um, the, the black outline with that. Um, this one, uh, let's see, I want to make sure I get this right. It was um, uh, sold, eventually sold to collector Lawrence Graff, who bid for the work himself in New York um, against three others carrying a pre-sale estimate of $30 million. Um, the work was part of a blockbuster uh, auction and eventually sold to Lawrence for $56.1 million. I should have found out how much the original Picasso sold for, but uh, just fascinating. Um, he also, uh, of course, was very familiar with Claude Monet. Um, he saw the, fo the photographs um, of, of uh, Monet's uh, many, he did many series. He did the Rouen Cathedral and of course all the haystacks, uh, which inspired uh, the young pop artist to create what he called manufactured Monet's. Uh, so Man Monet actually painted 25 haystacks a series and Lichtenstein's appropriation delved into the nature of repetition by taking this iconic image and then uh, by then cheapened by overexposure and popularity and reinvesting it with renewed ironic vigor and relevancy. So he wanted actually to breathe life back into that by um, putting his own spin on the subject. Yet for both artists, Monet and Lichtenstein, um, the subject is less important than the act of seeing because Monet was only concerned with the light. And it is precisely the obsession with sight that this exhibition's pairing investigates. Monet argued, the motif is something secondary for me. What I want to render is what is between the motif and me. In comparison, Lichtenstein said, my work isn't about form, it's about seeing. So again, this is visual narrative that both of these artists were doing um, and, and trying to take this, this rather bland subject and, and again, and, and make it a masterwork of art. And so this is also kind of his connection between uh, modernism and postmodernism, and kind of that bridge uh, to, to cross us there. And uh, this is uh, one by, uh, oops, I forgot to put his name up here, but by uh, Henri Matisse um, with the goldfish. And uh, this is uh, Lichtenstein's uh, version with his still life with goldfish. Um, so again, just fascinating using the same things, but exploring, trying to reimagine those images in, uh, from his point of view. Uh, this is a work of a series of painting uh, Lichtenstein made in the early 1990s, uh, depicting domestic interiors, um, painted on a very large scale. 
They were inspired by billboard advertisements uh, for a furniture store that Lichtenstein had seen outside of Rome in 1989. And the picture above on the left um, is, is the composition of um, uh, Lichtenstein's water lilies uh, from the early 1990s based on Monet's water lilies. And that of course provides the, the title for this painting. But again, just the simplicity of, of taking everything and reducing it down to these colors and lines and shapes and forms is really kind of amazing. And this is another one. Uh, this is uh, Van Gogh's uh, Van Gogh um, uh, bedroom at Arles um, that he also reproduced and, and also kind of made it more modern here. And I believe this is what was the Art Institute of Chicago kind of based. They made a replica of Van Gogh's room and kind of also used Lichtenstein's ideas as well. And again, using that, that magna on canvas. But uh, just this, this wonderful reproduction of this, again, appropriating it just like he appropriated the comic strips, and, but putting it into his own voice. Now, this was a part of prints that uh, Lichtenstein made during uh, 1996, the year before he died. Um, he explored here the refracted style of cubism um, found in such modern masters as Picasso. Um, uh, however, in his hands, with his use of the bende dots, the blocks of color, and the stark black outlines, the dislocated features are transformed into highly stylized imagery, um, more common to slick cartoons and comic books. Instead of using subject matter that was con considered every day, I used subject matter that was celebrated as art, Lichtenstein said. What I wanted to express wasn't that Picasso was known and therefore commonplace. Nobody thought of Picasso as common. What I am painting is a kind of Picasso done the way a cartoonist might do it or the way it might be described to you. So it loses the subtleties of a Picasso, but it takes on other characteristics. The P Picasso is converted, to, is converted to my pseudo cartoon style and takes on a character of its own. So he said, artists have often converted the work of other artists into their own style, which is what he was doing here. And it really had done his entire career. And uh, uh, Lichtenstein continued to push his art. Um, and in one of his last series of, of, of artworks, he was actually being inspired by a Chinese landscape painting. So he's using the dots here, but still very monochromatic. We can see the little boat down there in the lower left-hand corner. Um, and so he continued to push his art up into the very end. So Roy Lichtenstein died um, at the New York University Medical Center at the age of 73 on September 29th, 1997 from complications of pneumonia. But what a wonderful career he left us and just uh, and a new way um, to discover uh, uh, other art and, and really the genesis of pop art as well. So I hope you have enjoyed this lecture. I look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.